from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. In 1989, Tom Wolfe published an essay in Harper's Magazine, a literary manifesto on the new social novel. Instead of the cerebral games and narrow self-referential plots that now pass for fiction, he argued, American novelists should, quote, head out into this wild, bizarre, unpredictable, hog-stomping, baroque country of ours and reclaim it as literary property. This was and is good advice, and he's taken it. Departing from a wildly successful decades-long career as a nonfiction writer at the forefront of the new journalism movement, he's hog-stomped out three Baroque novels, first about New York financiers, then about Atlanta real estate, and most recently about college students. In these enormous novels, and the enormous body of his nonfiction which preceded it, Tom Wolfe has presented America with a dazzling, invigorating, and sometimes frightening mirror. He's given us novels big enough and popular enough and interesting enough to grab the national attention away from a thousand other distractions and allowed us a pleasure that's all too rare, the chance to talk to one another about ideas in a book. As the Christian Science Monitor once said, finally, America has its own Charles Dickens. Ladies and gentlemen, a man in full, Tom Wolfe. Thanks very much. When Ron Charles put you in the same paragraph with Charles Dickens, it's just time to retire. I mean, why, why proceed? Why get a, um, you know, I've been thinking so much about how it is that people start uh, writing. What makes people want to, uh, to write? I think essentially it's vanity. Very few, um, in fact, I cannot think of a young writer who started writing, you know, let's say in the late teens, who had anything to say. Um, you'll find that writers who start writing at an older age usually do so because they do have something uh, to say. Uh, for example, uh, James Webb, an Annapolis graduate who uh, <clears throat> became the most decorated Marine in Vietnam, um, was briefly a Secretary of the Navy at one point, um, felt so strongly about Vietnam, not the purpose of the war, uh, which he felt was, was very idealistic, but the way it was carried out, uh, that he wrote one of the greatest of the Vietnam uh, novels called Fields of Fire. But young people, as I did, start off, they just want to write. Um, and when you, since you have nothing to say, or you haven't had much experience, uh, what you tend to do is, uh, is realize that you have, or you believe, you have a certain facility with words. You, you can make music with words in a way that your classmates uh, are unable to. And it's usually true, and that's why there have been so many great young poets, because poetry is the music uh, of literature, and it's, it can strike the heart without, without taking that detour through the, uh, uh, through the, through the forebrain. Um, uh, Keats or Shelley, uh, they, uh, Byron, for that, for that matter, these great, great young, um, young poets. But then you, they, and we're in an age now where if you are vain enough to want a large public, uh, the, the game is right now, it's all prose, whether it's nonfiction or fiction. Uh, now this presents a problem. Let's say you want to write fiction. This probably is still the great um, goal of young writers now, although I think, frankly, that more interesting stuff has been done in nonfiction uh, over the last 60 years. Um, in any case, what you tend to do is to cannibalize your life so far. Let's say you've 
you're 25 years old. Well, you take all the experience of those 25 years and you turn out a great novel. It's uh, terrific reviews. You think you're on your way. Uh, there's one little problem, though. Well, Ralph Waldo Emerson said that every person on earth has a great autobiography to write if he only knows what is his unique experience. But he never said everybody has two great <laughs> autobiographies uh, to write. So that second novel is, is usually about a young guy who keeps trudging up five flights to his uh, top floor apartment on, in, let's say, New York on West 52nd Street near the river, but not near enough to see it. Um, and he's a young writer who's had all these great reviews, and people know his name, but he doesn't have any money. He's, uh, He's unlucky at love. Uh, frankly, it's not a very interesting novel. Uh, it's just some a kind of a morose person, uh, a morose young person. Uh, morose young people really don't go over terribly, terribly well. Um, maybe they can pull it off, but it's, it's not that great. So at that point, I think writers should face up to the fact, as all the great 19th century novelists did, that your own life is not sufficient, unless you were Tolstoy. I mean, Tolstoy was a warrior. Uh, he was a socialite. Uh, he was a farmer. Uh, now, that's a man who had enough different lives to uh, keep turning out books without uh, going out and, and researching. But, you know, when uh, well, the, the, the great example was Zola, who would just write one novel after another in a different area of, of, of French life. Um, it could be the going down into the coal mines. It could be going into the slums. But in order to write about the coal mines, in order to write about the slums, you've got to go there. And you have to actually have to take a look at what, um, at what goes on. Um, even, I mean, Balzac, for example, would break off in the middle of a novel and just go um, out into the countryside to find out what a typical funeral in the countryside is like. Um, and this was routine. Uh, Dickens, of course, going off to the west of England, posing as a father, wanting to park his, his son uh, in some dreadful boarding school just to get him out of his hair, um, just to pick up material for Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Nickleby. And in, in this country, it has been a great source of, of, of literature. Uh, I, can, I think of the great period in American literature, certainly in terms of the novel, uh, began in 1893 with Stephen Crane's Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. And it goes up through, incidentally, Stephen Crane was a newspaper reporter. Um, it, the New York, um, the old New York Tribune. Um, and it goes up to 1939 with John Steinbeck's um, The Grapes of Wrath. Now, in that whole period, when you think of novelists like Das Passos, Sinclair Lewis, who was our first Nobel Prize winner in, uh, in literature, uh, or Edith Wharton, who was still very active at that time, or uh, Richard Wright, or uh, Ernest Hemingway, my namesake, uh, Thomas Wolfe, or James M. Cain, uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, these, were, these were great, great figures in American literature. And Practically all of them um, acted without, they didn't call themselves reporters, but they were reporters. I mean, Steinbeck went to work as a reporter on purpose for the, the San Francisco News to get the material that he would need for the Grapes of Wrath. He didn't know anything about Okies fleeing the Dust Bowl and coming out to, uh, to California, but he wanted to see the way they lived in these uh, uh, camps. So he bought an old truck, an old pie truck, he said it was, um, and stocked some food and some blankets and just started touring these uh, camps. And one day, at one of these um, camps where the, the Okies who were working on the farms, these great agribusiness farms, uh, were, were sort of all huddled together, he came across a couple uh, who were living on the, on the ground with a piece of carpet covering them at night 
and they'd built a kind of wall out of reeds and old hubcaps, uh, and the mother had just given birth to her second stillborn child within a year, and Steinbeck said, you know, the, the light bulb went on over his head, this is the journey. And, and even though he was thinking of the Jodes as typical, you know, typical specimens of these refugees, um, Ma Jode and Tom Jode are two of the most vivid characters in our, our literature. Um, it's very hard to top those two, those two figures uh, as, as characters. And he would have never, yeah, the point I'd like is the, the unaided imagination of the novelist is, uh, as Philip Roth one, once put it, helpless before what he knows he's going to read in tomorrow morning's newspaper. I mean, I'll just give you one example. Paris Hilton. Um, now, I suppose that certainly there would, could have been novelists who would come up with a plot in which a, um, a beautiful, as they always called her, hotel heiress. She's got so much money on her own now, I don't know how they can keep calling her the hotel heiress. She's worth more than the whole chain. But anyway, uh, how such a young woman is caught on a pornographic tape. But now, what would the rest of the novel be? It would be about extortion. She's trying to move heaven and earth, pay the five million dollars they're demanding uh, to hold to keep this thing uncovered. Uh, and there might be a great complication. You might she might find a couple of computer hackers in college, uh, and she gets them to uh, try to break into her father's uh, investment account to withdraw five off the extortionists. But then they demand a ten percent cut of the five million. I mean, it could, be, it could be a very good book, but that's the, that's the train it would take. Or, I think there are a lot of novelists who could have come up with a plot in which um, the same beautiful hotel uh, of no known acting talent um, <laughs> gets a $10 million television contract uh, and ends up, she's so popular that she ends up uh, with a line of clothes, a line of perfumes, um, and a line of handbags. You know, I don't understand handbags and women. <laughs> I don't get it. I mean, the, the first thing that Monica Lewinsky did after she hit the newspapers was, was to issue a line of handbags. I, don't, I really do not understand this. In any case, but I, I don't think that there, I don't think there's any novelist anywhere in the world uh, who could have thought up the plot in which the young heiress gets these millions because she made a pornographic tape. I mean, if she had not made that tape, she would be a fading, bold-faced name uh, in, the, in the press today. Um, but she, uh, she did make uh, the tape, and it just set the world on fire. I mean, everybody's computer was red hot. Uh, passing around that uh, that particular film, um, I'm telling you, it's, you you, I think you have to go out into this world, and you'll be there'll be so many great um, surprises that it does more than just bring you vivid material. It turns on the uh, imagination. Uh, I give you a good example from Emile Zola. Uh, Zola posed as a secretary of a member of the French Assembly and went down into the mi uh, mines, about 15 stories down, uh, into the coal mines in, in France, uh, wearing a frock coat, <coughs> a stiff topper of the 19th century type, shine, shiny shoes with his notebook. His, he wore these uh, pince-nez spectacles. Uh, I particularly like what he wore to go down there. I mean, I, th I thought that, that was <coughs> I thought that was great. <clears throat> anyway, uh, he gets down uh, 15 stories in the earth, and he sees these horses who are dragging sleds full of coal through these dim, tiny corridors in the mines. So he asks one of the miners, says, how on earth do you get those horses in and out every day? And they start laughing, and then they realize he's serious, and, and one of them says, Mr. Zola, don't you understand? These horses come down here once. They are barely beyond being foals. Um, they are lowered in nets. 
Um, they grow up down here. They work down here. They pull uh, sleds of coal down here. They never see daylight again. They only see the light that's down here. And where they can no longer work, they're just buried down here. It, that image is one of the great images in 19th century fiction. And because it, you, it didn't need a word of explanation, they were the miners. Those horses were the miners who, uh, by virtue of circumstances, economic circumstances, were doomed to a life of going down into the mines in their teens and, uh, and, and, and never emerging, at least in a, in a psychological um, sense, even though they, they could come and see daylight. <coughs> That's what I mean about going out and finding detail uh, as something that, that helps the imagination. It's not just local color. Um, I've been so absorbed in Stephen Crane uh, recently. Um, I, had, I read Maggie, A Girl of the Streets for the first time, I have to confess, about three months ago. Everyone's read The Red Badge of Courage, as, as I did. Um, it's one of the first things, first novels that uh, uh, students are given in, in, in high, one of the first serious novels students are given in high school for two reasons. Um, Crane believed in writing that could be immediately understood. And the other thing is short. Uh, if you want to live in literary history, you should write short books. Uh, I haven't got a chance. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm done for. But uh, uh, you got that, that's, what they'll, you know, that's what they'll always assign. Uh, anyway, Crane was a newspaper reporter in the in North Shore of New Jersey, the resort area. <clears throat> and one day, Jacob Reese, one day in eight, uh, 1892, Jacob Reese was giving a lecture, so he covered it. <clears throat> Two years before, 1890, Jacob Reese uh, had resented, uh, I'm sorry, presented, uh, published a book called How the Other Half Lives which lit up the sky, it was the first exposure, the first light that was shined on the horrible slum conditions uh, of the Lower East Side uh, in New York. Uh, he also took photographs of the people in the slums, and, and they are very, those photographs are extremely f famous today along with the, along with the book. So uh, <clears throat> Stephen Crane's listening to this, but he says to himself, I wonder what these people are like, what do they feel? when they're in this situation, because that didn't interest, that didn't interest Reese. He didn't even record their speech. He was just horrified by their circumstances, and he was a reformer. He was kind of the literary accompanist, Jane Addams, um, and, uh, and the other great reformers of that, of that period. So he moved to New York to the Lower East Side. He roomed with a, a group of medical students um, and he created a Bowery bum outfit for himself. He's 21 years old, but he managed to make himself look besotted enough, dreary enough, and he had a wispy mustache, a wispy beard. He wore a, um, a tattered suit uh, and a derby with a torn brim. It's interesting in the old days that even people of poverty tried to dress up. Uh, today, People of wealth try to dress down, and uh, people with no wealth uh, try to dress even worse unless they are um, servants, in which case the man living, leaving the $20 million apartment, that's what they, they, they cost now, on Fifth Avenue in New York, is, is dressed in a motorcycle jacket, a uh, T-shirt that says mother was wrong, uh, a <laughs> pair of timber, uh, you know, timberline boots, with the soles are like rock ledges, you know, they're about out, out to here. And the doorman, the doorman is wearing a uniform. He looks like an eight, a, a, a Austrian colonel from uh, 1870. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, a, it, it's a wild thing at this uh, moment. And I want everyone to remember, not to, I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody, because everyone here looks pretty well dressed to me, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Evelyn Waugh said that the reason the British lost their empire, uh, where the sun used to never set, you know, uh, was that they started allowing colonial officers to wear short pants. <laughs> now I want everyone to, 
I want everybody to think about that. Um, um, anyway, um, Crane, not only did he pretend to be a, a Bowery uh, bum, he slept in flop houses not once, uh, but over and over again. He saw a, a he saw a line of of uh, down and out people waiting in a bread line in a snowstorm, and he insisted on he saw it out a window. He insisted on joining them without wearing just a shirt because so many of them were freezing. And he stood there for four hours, and it's his medical student roommate said, you can't do that. You, go to, you, you, you can't go out there wearing just a shirt. And he says, it's not reporting unless I feel as bad as they feel. Uh, so he would do that. Actually, all of this is one of the reasons he died at the age of 28. I mean, he, <laughs> he uh, I'm sure, of tuberculosis, which he could have very well picked up in those flop houses. Uh, he smoked dreadfully, and, uh, and, and he probably got all kinds of, uh, ran himself down from things like standing in line in the cold. Um, but he then, he wrote the uh, Red Badge of Carriage based on material uh, <clears throat> that he found as a long, a four-volume book of reminiscences of the Civil War called Battles and Generals, Battles and Leaders of the Civil War. And he found this material. And I think the experience of writing Maggie, he was writing about a girl who sinks into, a very pretty girl who sinks into prostitution in the, in the slums, uh, made him realize he could go into the persona of other people. Uh, if he could do it with a girl in the slums, he could do it with people in battle in the Civil War. And he wrote that, that great book. I think it's less known that thereafter, he, be he became the most fearless war correspondent probably this country has ever seen, even the great Richard Harding Davis. No one can match uh, Stephen Crane. He went down to Cuba in the, in the Spanish-American War of, uh, of 1898. At one point, a, a signal man who's like in the Army, that's like a wigwag person on the deck of a ship, uh, was shot and killed, and he had learned this uh, hand signals and this, that the signal men use in order to cover battles better. You know, if, if he could see what they were signaling, uh, he would be on top of it as a writer. So instead, he just sprang up in the guy's place uh, wearing a white rubber, I like this part too, a white rubber um, raincoat that went down almost to, it went down to his calf. And there you have to stand on the highest promontory you can to give these hand signals. And people could not believe it. He was the most obvious target in the Spanish-American uh, War, the most, the most obvious that there ever was. Um, this became, a, this not to that extent, but it became a tradition among American writers. Even somebody like Sinclair Lewis, um, who never worked for a newspaper, uh, when he wrote his first great novel, the one that gave, made him famous, Main Street, he went back to his hometown. But he didn't write about his hometown from out of his old oaken bucket full of childhood memories. He went there with a stack of five by eight cards, the kinds you use in graduate school all the time, uh, and just started taking notes everywhere, he, the way the town was today. Uh, he did the same thing with Babbitt, which the, is the, he was our first Nobel Prize winner in literature, and that Babbitt was the, the novel mentioned in the citation. Uh, he um, <coughs> went all over Cincinnati uh, taking notes on the life of the new American um, businessman. Of course, it was a scathing portrait. It was also a great piece of a great piece of uh, reporting. Ernest Hemingway started off as a newspaper man. Uh, Dreiser, Dreiser would have never written those great novels without having been a newspaper uh, reporter. Um, of the say twenty great novelists of that great period, uh, about if I remember the figure correctly, about a little almost two thirds had worked as newspaper men, and many of the others had this reporting instinct. Now that is, from today's literature, has, uh, has just about gone. Um, it's uh, considered rather vulgar to be sinking your hands into the muck of, 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 American, of American life. We have now been Europeanized in uh, the novel. Uh, it should be psychological. Uh, it, it, it should... Uh, it have a certain clever isms about it that make 
it's obvious that you know that, and your reader knows that this is all a clever game we're playing with, uh, uh, with words. Anyway, if I could just leave you with this one message. And I, I assume there are probably lots of people under this tent right now who are interested in doing writing themselves. Uh, it'd be, it would be that. This is an astonishing country. It's unexplored almost. Uh, and my, my only message is go, go to it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.